afternoon. We're supposed to be talking about Calcutta's tryst wit taste, but as it's many years since I lived in Calcutta, and I don't think Pushpeshri's lived here at all. Uh, my only connection with the city is my mother studied here at Shanti Niketan and occasionally came to this place about 80 years ago. So we're going to expand the horizon and we'll talk about food in India in general, and of course we'll include Calcutta. Uh, Pushpeshri. If I were to ask you to pick the biggest trends in Indian food at the moment, what would you pick? Uh, Virbhai, I think the, the most visible trend is that we are, we are encountering the evolution of pan-Indian taste. Okay. So it, if we, let's, let's bring Kolkata in right here. Yeah. That earlier there was only Rasogolla and Bengali sweets. Right. But now more and more people are also aware of something called Bape Ilij, Bape Dai. They are also, you know, Alu Bhaja. They are also yeah. interested in the Kabiraji cutlet yeah. and the Kolkata biryani. Now people who were um, not in Bengal, not in Kolkata, thought that this was it. Yeah. No, I, you know, I have a barber who does the trimming for me in uh, Delhi. Right. And he told me that if you come to our I will give you pitai paratha. And pitai paratha with ghugni. So that was the kind of thing. It was not the food of the elite. It was not yeah. the food which was being written about. It was not the food which Bhadralok uh, enjoyed. Yeah. But people on the street. So I think Kolkata food is not only Bengali food. It has a bit of Anglo-India. It has a bit of... Uh, the Marwadi, it has a bit of Bihari, and it of course has a straight social stratification. So I think pan Indian, the most interesting trend for me yeah. is the young Indian millennials getting aware of food of other regions, sub regions, ethnicities, and adopting them. Okay, so number one is that because of increased communication, increased travel, we are more aware of what other people eat. But there are other trends, aren't there? Isn't there, in a sense, the Punjabification of restaurant food? Uh, may I be forgiven for this? I think um, one of the saddest things to happen to Indian food was what you call the Punjabification. Yeah. When the refugees came in large influx post-partition, they were suffering. And they were trying to rebuild their homes. And they were trying to strike roots in alien soil. And what happened is that then came Tandoor with them. Yeah. Now, we romanticize tandoor today and we say tandoor is sanja chula, it goes back to the tradition of Punjab in the village where women uh, encircled around it and talked and cooked all kinds of slow food. But to my mind, it was one of those necessities that there was no kitchen, there was no home. And tandoor, which has been um, uh, researched by Ranjit Rai, is yeah. as early as in, in a very good book, yeah. civilization. So it was not only a Punjabi invention, it spread from Haryana to everywhere. And tandoori food was one kind of food. Right. But then it was, I think, the tyranny of tandoor, what I call, hmm. is what has, um, I mean, you know, now all, you all want dal, you get kali dal, madi dal. Yeah. And I, somebody got so sick of it, he said, madi dal, where is the bhendi dal coming, you know? <laughs> and and you, 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 unfortunately, even um, in UP, you, they have forgotten what their dal was. They say yellow dal and kali dal. And yellow dal is something which um, irritates me no end. Wo, Dhula moong hai, wo dhuli urad hai, wo masoor hai, wo chana hai. Even in Bengal, you have a yellow dal which is cholar dal. And you have uh, bhaja moong, uh, uh, amra hal diye. So the point is that even the Bengalis know two varieties of moong at least. And uh, eaten very well. Cholar dal is made a totally different thing. But we have forgotten in this Punjabification yeah. that other dals exist. Also the butter chickenization of India. I remember going on holiday in Kerala, which is of course one of India's greatest cuisines, if not the greatest cuisine, and the buffet was all butter paneer and butter chicken. Uh, well, this is again interesting. I think my, my Punjabi friends, I mean, I will make more enemies from uh, Punjabi clan than anything else. I think this, this butter chicken is one of the greatest cons of Indian culinary. One of the greatest cons? No, okay, I mean, there are many. That. Explain that. Now, people are trying to fight and take credit for having invented butter chicken. Right. The story is very simple. There is nobody after Prometheus who can claim that he invented or discovered or brought back fire to the earth. Right. It's as simple as this. There was a stale tandoori chicken which had failed to sell the evening before and it had to be gotten rid of the next morning. So you put a little butter, you put a little tomato puree and uh, I have it from... Uh, uh, Mr. Kundalal's partners, not yeah. uh, the Moti Mahal ones. The story is very simple. There was a 92-year-old man who mm, 
dictated his, not recorded his memoirs, he said three of us had lost our job from Lahore where we were workers in a restaurant and we didn't know where our next meal would come and we met accidentally at a theka, Deshi Sharab ka, and mm. said, kaisi kat rahi, tu kya kar raha? Bola, humko to roti ka kaam aata hai, wohi karenge. A good friend who had a little better resources gave them 15,000 rupees, which was a princely sum right. then in 47, 48, and they started Moti Mahal. And his butter chicken, if you eat, yeah. has no butter, has no tomatoes. And I don't distrust him because this man was had made his millions by that time. Mm. His son is a computer specialist in New York and yeah. his partner is a Bagai Motorwala. This, this is Jaggi you're talking about? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and then, you know, is like the, is the other corn is like the Manchurian, uh, Manchurian Gobi and things of uh. that kind. When uh, somebody like Wong would say that I sort of did it for Indian palate, but basically it was a necessity and butter was added on to it because I think once the Dhabe Wala became affluent, yeah. he could once again afford to eat butter, <coughs> which he used to eat in Punjab. So this is one of those things, I think, that butter chicken is one of those things which gets me into a um, hysterical paroxysm. Okay. Also, the use of tomato, you mentioned dal. The black dal, which started out as Moti Mahal dal, is now called dal Bukhara the butter chicken gravy, they all use a lot of tomato which is relatively recent, no? Which I think ruins food. I mean, yeah. it may not be recent because some people would say that if the, uh, potatoes can go into masal dosa from Tamil Nadu and Tamrams have no problems with that, why should the Portuguese who brought the tomatoes should yeah, be... Yeah, but, but I mean by recent is it's a colonial thing, there's no, no Indian no, tradition. Uh, yes, very, very <coughs> much so and I think it ruins all food. If you have a makhni gravy, yeah. you can call it a makhni paneer, you can call it a makhni murg, you yeah. can even make a makhni uh, machidi, you can make a whatever, you know, you, makhan and uh, the Hindi phrase has it, you butter up somebody and you <laughs> get what you want. Yeah. So why have we fallen so much in love with the tomato? We haven't fallen in love. It has been pushed like a drug outside the schools on us from our childhood. So the, really? kid, the kid goes to Red sugar, like brown sugar. No, is uh, well, the real brown sugar, okay. the real stuff. Yeah. You, you go to a restaurant and what can the kid eat? He can't eat something very highly spiced. Yeah. The parents are eating something else. So the Poor kid is ordering a butter chicken, which is Swedish tomato gravy. And then you acquire, so to speak, a taste on the palate, which is difficult to get in rid of. It gives you a little sugar fix. Yeah. It gives you a tomato sauce familiarity. It doesn't breed contempt in this case. It sort of hooks you on to more. And you get a chicken ka leg, so you may not have the scotch ka back till much later in life. But you can handle a chicken ka leg and you can have tomato sauce, which is you are familiar with in samosa or chutney mm. or chops and so on. So, and it saves the cook a lot of time trouble to prepare one makhni gravy with tomato and, and put everything in it and give the vegetarians the paneer <laughs> and give the non-vegetarians the chicken. But you mentioned vegetarians being given the paneer. At some stage in the 20th century at restaurants, paneer came to be regarded as a vegetable. When did that happen? Uh, I, I think this again, you know, how many corns can you discover and list <laughs> That's right. Because paneer is dairy. It is not, uh, not a vegetable. Yeah. Lentils are lentils. And you have mushrooms which are fungus. So you basically, because you wanted to the vegetarian patron not to feel shortchanged. So he was given something of value. And right now in Hills, where I come from, yeah. paneer is more expensive than chicken. The chicken is selling at 180 rupees a kilo. Paneer, which comes from the plains, is selling at 300 rupees a kilo. And of course, the local people, some of them suspect that the chicken is cheaper because some poor chicken dies in transportation and is sold at a price <laughs> less than a dead crow. But yeah. that's, that, that's a different story. But paneer uh, was not known to us in Hills when right. we were growing up. And paneer spoils very fast because it's a dairy product. And since you see these movies, which are fairly scary documentaries, paneer being made with urea and milk and uh, so the detergent and so on, I would keep I don't my know distance. That. Paneer oh. made with detergent? Uh, milk, milk, milk. Uh, milk made with detergent and urea okay. and thickened with all kinds of unmentionable things. It's not like the garam masala, which is ghode ki lead, but is as bad as that. Urea is as close to dung and piss, you is know, as bad, you can yeah. come to. And no, and it, it, you don't want to eat it. Mm. So you douse it with tomato and masala and so on. So the other thing is a kadhai mur, kadhai paneer, you know. Same similarity. Yeah, again, kadhai cooking is not the world's most subtle cuisine, no? But all of this essentially comes to the Punjab, no? Uh, yes, I think this is again going to be politically very incorrect. No, no, it's, lot it's too late to stop now. That should be said. A lot of the faking came with the Punjabi refugee because yeah. the poor kid could not afford to give you things in purity, which he did in his undivided Punjab. So he was selling something which would sell, 
and if he could push something, I remember growing up in hills at the altitude of 8,000 feet. So Mr. Tandon used to come as a periwala and sell clothes. Okay. There was Rabel Singh who did the trade in woolens. Then there was a person who introduced everybody to chicken and paneer. And paneer was a rarity. So and even Rajma, because there yeah. was no pressure cooking and yeah. the boiling temperature of water was lower in the hills. So we never cooked Rajma at all because it never was done right. right. But then came pressure cooker. And then Rajma was around, and it was a novelty in mid 50s. But afterwards, it's sickening to have. I mean, you know, my son yeah. uh, unfortunately fell in love with a Punjabi girl. And now they are separated, <laughs> so the unfortunate <laughs> part is not there. And my, the mother in law got on me, my nerves. Every time I would go say, Aapke liye samdhi ji, maine kali dal aur rajma banaya hai. <laughs> so if it was not kali dal, it was rajma. If it was not rajma, it was pindi chana masala. The only sabzi I could eat as sabzi was gobi masala. But how much gobi can you eat even if you have the fractals and cauliflowers in mind? And then you are always eating paneer. So paneer came out of my ears and I can't bear the sight of paneer. I must put my biases clear. I, I'm also not a paneer eater. But Gujaratis, for instance, never ate paneer. But if you go to Ahmedabad now, every single vegetarian restaurant, the fastest moving item is paneer. Yes, I mean, my mother came from Katiawar and she was very fond of uh, rearing us up on Katiawari food. Uh, so I had a little short of coming out of my ear Katiawari food. Okay. Uh, but the point is the Gujaratis find paneer interesting because that gives them the masala of the meaty thing yeah. without having the meat. And most of them are closet non-vegetarians, yeah. but they hate to come out. So yeah. the greatest adventure they have is to cook omelette on the chat when nobody is watching or <laughs> go out in their luxuries <laughs> for ice cream at midnight. Yeah. But uh, paneer is the next sinful seduction. Okay. Do you think th things are changing? That people are moving away from butter chicken and paneer masala or mutter paneer, that the Indian palate is getting more sophisticated? Uh, I wish I could say without doubt that this was happening. I can see it happening among the millennials, the yeah. people who are coming out for small towns, coming to metros, to working in call centers. Through peer group pressure, they are eating pizzas, they are eating hamburgers, they are eating momos, they are eating uh, chow mein, they are, they are experimenting with four Thai, four Italian, yeah. four, and there is a greater health awareness. So you are trying to say that I am eating more organic, but the paneer walas have not given up. No. You see the Navaratri thing, Domino's comes out with a pizza with a paneer crust instead of cheese and tikkas made out of paneer again and alu tikki is broken out into things. So it's perfectly kosher on a Navaratri fasting day, but you still have a pizza and you still have a lots of tomato sauce in it. So I hope the kids get wise to it and uh, at least go the route of uh, harm reduction. Mm. No brown sugar, but marijuana legalized would be acceptable. So <laughs> slivers of paneer would be fine. Why do you think people are now looking for other cuisines? For instance, we briefly mentioned Manchurian. Chinese cuisine in India, which is largely unknown in China, the kind of cuisine we have, is pretty much a basic Indian cuisine now, isn't it? No, I, I think that again is a very interesting question because the Chinese cuisine in India has so many regional variations right. that the Chindian uh, connoisseurship is different. You mentioned the Gujarati paneer yeah. and you would have a Paneer 65 in down south, yeah. and you would have a Punjabi paneer, which is the Chinese would have a different sauce there. Yeah. So you would have a Punjabi Chinese, you would have a Gujarati Chinese, you would have a Tamilian Chinese, and so on. So I think A, you may not know what real Chinese ever is, what yeah. Shizuan is, what Pekinese is, what Cantonese is, what is, but you would like to experiment. And now yeah. more, more and more people are intrepid. They are giving up taboos. So they are not worried about the unmentionable meat, which this is state, of course, you can mention without yeah. the fear of getting lynched. So beef you can eat. In, in Delhi, we say tenderloin, you know? Yeah. So let's confuse people. And say, Ki khar hai, tenderloin. But khar in Haryana, I think the penalty for being in possession of beef is great in the penalty for many other crimes, including Penalty statutory. comes later. It is like the Telangana encounter. Before you go have a penalty in a court of law, you would be lynched. So yeah. oh, we, we don't worry about that. You know, I think that's the saddest part about it. So the young Indians have traveled a little, gone out of their house a little, and they are not worried to experiment. Also, you mentioned pizzas, pasta, fast food, how much it's caught on noodles, chow mein. What's interesting, it strikes me, is almost everything that's taken off in India in the last 15 to 20 years is carbohydrate based. Are we heading for an American style obesity crisis because all of the fast food and the new food is all totally carbs? 
No, I'm not really sure about that because I think our traditional diet has been a carb-based diet. So we have rice and we have atta. So I mean, but we have sabzis along with it. The, the, the roti is only to pick up the sabzis. Here, the roti is the point. No, but the, po the point. But the point is, uh, Veer Bhai, you are talking like a person who has uh, never wanted for anything on the plate. Uh, you, you, if you do use the Hindi phrases, "ab dal roti khate the, sabzi ab afford nahi karte the." Aaj to achhe din aage hain, dal mehengi ho gayi, sabzi nahi milti hai. To sab a poor me. प्यासी there is always that thing. There's I can, always see, that. The I can see that. But there was always grains as part of the Indian exactly. diet. But have we ever as a nation consumed as much maida as we do today? Uh, no, uh, but but why uh, uh, talk about maida only in the context of pastas and pizzas and so on? Okay. What is the double roti? Even the brown bread is an artificially mm. coloured, uh, uh, brushed with egg yolk True. roti, which most people don't yeah. even bother to think about. So we were eating a lot of stuff, uh, which was maida. In disguised forms. True. The luchi, I mean, there must be Bengalis in the audience, is essentially a maida puri. Ah, but, but that's, that's sublime. So that maida we don't <laughs> treat as maida. <laughs> a batura is maida? Batura is maida because of our bias, my bias at least towards Punjab, I would say batura, no, no, luchi is sublime. <laughs> okay. You're really not very, very keen on Punjabi food, no? No, no, I hate Punjabi food because it is. Okay, all right. Uh, I think that's a. No, but no. Why. I, I will tell you what happens is that I come from an area where Nepal, Tibet, and uh, India borders meet. Yeah. And there you come across a dhaba called Shere Punjab. And where everybody, after a couple of, you know, there's an old phrase, Surya As Pahar Mast, everybody tipples, they start tippling at 11 o'clock in the morning. And they sit at this thing and they have a half cooked tandoori chicken and they have madi dal and the breads. You go for naans. You go for a tandoori roti, which looks clean, but a good tandoori roti, like a good khabiri roti, would not be made of maida. It would be, and a Bengali would not eat luchi every day of his life. So that's not. That's where the difference is. Okay. The Punjabis, the dhaba seller owners, have succeeded in convincing the people that there is nothing better than a naan. There is nothing better than a tandoori chicken. There is nothing better than a madi dal, and they will take the rest. And usually, I mean, I'm. I hope there aren't that many vegetarians in the audience. Usually, they don't tell you they put anda in the naan. No, no, they don't. They don't. But anda to वैसे भी मतलब जैसे मछली बंगाल में जल तो रही है. तो anda तो मतलब unfertilized egg. Gandhi ji had a long debate on this yeah. that whether it should be eaten or not eaten. So I think we have convinced ourselves what we think is non-vegetarian or violent. We will accept. Otherwise, हम झटका भी खा लेंगे अगर अष्टमी का दिन है, दुर्गा पूजा के दिन बलि है, तो हम वो भी खा लेंगे. How many vegetarians in the audience? Put your hands up. Okay. How many people who don't eat egg in the audience? Okay. Do you eat naans? So you eat egg. All right, everybody. <laughs> yeah. You eat pro if you eat processed cheese, uh, yeah. you don't think about it, no? No. You're happy to eat cakes, cookies, etc. So eggs are like part of our diet now, no? Even for vegetarians. Um, I had an uncle who could eat all the cakes, pastries, things. He couldn't eat a sunny side up, so he said, I invisible egg is, it doesn't hurt me. <laughs> so pastry is okay, cake is okay. All right. What other trends do you see? Uh, the, the other trend I, I see is I do see an emergence of an pan-India taste, getting to know the other person's food a little better. Not yeah. only the Bengali food in Delhi, but also saying, uh, earlier we said Kerala ka khana, Kashmir okay. ka khana. And Kashmir ka khana in a food festival would be again uh, a vazwan. Nobody yeah. would talk of sal matta cooked at home. No. Nobody would talk of dried vegetables like sook wangan made or quince like, uh, you know, sabzi, bamsut ki sabzi. Yeah. Now you would again have a paneer of a Kashmiri variety which I have no problems with, but that chaman is a different thing and made with yellow chaman, red chaman, methi chaman. And uh, if the cheese comes out of Ladakh, a yak milk cheese, I have no problems. I can even chew the churbi for hours. You like yak milk cheese? Oh, I love it. Yeah, okay. It's a quiet taste. One of the problems with food and traditional food is that people are no longer cooking. Their mothers may have cooked. Their grandmothers may have cooked. 
but they tend to order in oh, oh, why go to grandmothers and mothers the, the wives have uh, been inspired by the women's liberation discourse and they don't cook and the husbands are reluctant to be uh, the you know cook old it has been in the kitchen in a different manner of speaking yeah. and in any case if there is a double income no kids family they want is more convenient to order so takeaways are flourishing tomatoes and swiggies i mean again are running a food empire which is totally different i think to borrow noam chomsky's phrase he of course used it in american political context yeah. manufacturing consent what we have suffered from for the last 25 30 years is manufactured taste you go to a shadi ka banquet the menu is the same yeah. you go to uh, whatever you do, restaurant is the same so i was in um, uh, assam and there was an assamese restaurant which had no assamese vegetable at all no mas tanga mas tanga no khar no nothing 11 items of paneer one kadi dal yeah. so i think that is what is the problem is that we have persuaded ourselves that this is what people want to eat now we were in arunachal pradesh which is at the very edge of india on the border with china and you would think that there would be influences of the local food but basically if you wanted to eat well in a restaurant the food at home was very good you could eat momos for breakfast and fried chicken the rest of the time fried chicken fried rice the rest of the time there was absolutely nothing else you could get butter chicken though yeah? you i think this again is a very interesting question that you have aspirational foods so yeah. we are working on a world bank project in jharkhand and we are working in a tribal belt and it was amazing that nobody under the age of 50 had any memories of any tribal food because they said wo to jab gareeb the tab khate the jab jungle mein kuch nahi tha tab forage food khate the ab to hum bhi aap aap jo khate hain hum wo khana chahte hain hum wohi khate hain jo aap khate hain so that is what it is but to get back to the point of pan indian taste yeah. is that you encounter an idli and a dosa and a uttapam and a vada almost in any part of the country Correct. and you i mean masala dosa is the indian fast food A masala dosa, or even a samosa, is a great Indian fast food, I yeah. think. And in 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 Kolkata, you could have a kopi uh, singhara, which yeah. is which will get rid of potatoes and it will be very nicely done here. Or you would have a Loknath ka banaras or Ilabad wala samosa made with the dal ki pitti, which is not all carbs as you would say. Right. Yeah. And uh, that would be very good. But we have been the the big business of food, uh, like Magdi. There is this uh, on the plane. I read the Times of India supplement for Sunday. And have you been to the new Mac? the ad says and then they tell tell us that how many potato tikki burgers are there and mm -hmm. how many i mean instead of a samosa yeah. you are getting a samosa pitti between two buns yeah i've actually never understood why people go to mcdonald's and eat an aloo tikki samosa or an aloo tikki chaat or an aloo tikki burger Be when it's much better on the street just go and have a vada pav uh, because i have somehow persuaded myself that the something on the streets is not hygienic it is not aspirational the golden arches call to me from miles away yeah. uh, i will never go to america but that is my bit of having tasted a bit of america yeah but you come to calcutta what the best puchkas in all of india what kind of idiot would go to mcdonalds when he could eat that yeah. uh, but what we have done to our puchkas in punjabi by nature is to fill them with vodka i saw that i saw that try to get our <laughs> patrons drunk on that but they give you a kick certainly yeah Oh, it certainly gives such a trick. Uh, I used to get those small kala jamuns, and uh, instead of kala jamuns, I used to take sultanas, put them in rum, and let them osmosis take care of that, and roll them in sugar, mm. and treat them as kala jam, and eat them in the library, and nobody was any wiser. That's clever. That's very clever. <laughs> so, looking ahead, where do you see Indian food going? Uh, I have one worry. I must share with this audience. Yeah. I think what is happening is that the breed of celebrity chefs. who are more celebrities less chefs yeah. and are chasing a mirage of michelin stars yeah. and what is happening abroad a good friend vikas kanna great showman uh, but he is setting the benchmarks for what indian cooking should be or gagan in bangkok so i think gagan is not cooking indian at all i don't think that vikas kanna is doing entirely uh, he has the very great patrons list Uh, Vikas Bhatia has got all Michelin stars Vineet, in all the restaurants. Vineet, 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 sorry, Vineet, 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 and Vineet does Indian. Vineet does a Hari Jale bhi. I wish more, more and more chefs were doing what Vineet is doing. He stays true to the Indian food roots and takes that to another level. This Hari Jale bhi is a Hari Ilaichi, Hara Pudina, thoda Hara Dhania, natural colors, and still a Mithai. 
and he does a square jalebi. I mean, you have sampled some of his stuff. I, I think indeed. Vineet is fantastic. So if that was the direction, but my concern is more. Vineet, again, is mostly a non-resident Indian chef uh, flying the flag of Indian food elsewhere. I would love to see Indian food evolving. When was, uh, I mean, the fight between, about Rasgulla between the Bengal and Odisha is hopefully over. But, no, it's not. No, it's but not. but, no, but when not. was Rasgulla invented by anybody, Bengali or Odia? When was the paratha or a halwa cooked for the first time? Why haven't we gone to the next level of a mithai, which is not rasgulla, which is not balushai, which is not halwa, which is not gujia, khaja, which is not a korma? You keep adding names and say, ye jahangiri korma, sabzai korma, uh, akbari ran, etc. But that's neither here nor there. It basically, it remains the same thing. So I'm worried about that the home cooking is, as you rightly said, because yeah. of mothers, grandmothers, and wives. And also and cooks. Their children and don't want to become cooks. No, no. Why should they? They, yeah. they, they are treated like paria even in a five-star kitchen. Yeah. They are called heritage cooks, but they want to do other things. Right. They want to not to soil their hands. Right. And most of us cannot now any longer afford to have cooks who are gifted or talented. Right. So we are, at one level, the home cooking has dried up. At other level, the business of creating a past for a restaurant dish is flourishing. Yeah. And in between, uh, there are some great chefs abroad working brilliantly with ingredients. You mentioned one. I mentioned one. Who else would you uh, rate? Uh, I, I think uh, I like what Ranbir Barar does most yes. of the time. He's a very, very good uh, chef. He's yeah. very, very good. Uh, this young man called Nishan Chaube, who was helping out Indus in Bangkok, uh, likes to cook vegetarian and Indian, and he's more interested in plating them interestingly. But I think I don't see the home, unless home cooks come out with interesting things, it will not be there. You're not a fan then of the master chefization of Indian food with celebrity TV oh, chefs? You know, you know, the point is the uh, food and sex have one great thing in common. You can't enjoy them vicariously. So if you see the MasterChef well, program... Speak, the for, speak for yourself. All right, <laughs> <laughs> all right I stand corrected. Uh, so the point is, it doesn't. the MasterChef program, the reality show, doesn't even make me drool. Because you have done so much television, Veer Bhai, yeah. that you know that everything is enacted, it's fake, everything yeah. is rehearsed, and everything is uh, partly prurient. <laughs> it is the difference between pornography and obscenity. So I can... Erotica and pornography. So I think... It falls between those two stools. So I like my food when I'm licking my fingers and I'm not mentioning other parts of the body. And uh, This and is going to be food. a fun session. Huh? I had no idea. What you're talking. But I don't think people realize that the food you see on television is usually not fit for human consumption. They just do it to make it look good. And also the, the, the recipe books which you have, uh, uh, they, the, the, I don't know what a food stylist is doing and what he is spraying on that to make it look yeah. good. Uh, uh, but I had one good experience when uh, Fiden printed out this India cookbook. Mm. They had all natural light, no frills, no food styling, point of view. and Which book was this? It's called India the Cookbook. Okay. And Indian vegetarian, it, they did not have a food stylist. They did not have artificial lighting and just the... I, th I think most people don't realize, even in Western publications, if you see a cake on television, even t Western TV on any BBC food show, and you see lots of cream on it, the cream is nearly always shaving cream, because real cream will melt, melt under the lights. So however good the food looks on television, you can't eat it. And yet we spend our lives trying to make that kind of food, right? I don't know. I mean, some of us fall for it, some of us don't. Oh, but, but you're not the average guy. You, you understand this stuff. Um, no, no. I, I'm a person with a split personality disorder from my childhood and <laughs> uh, remedies have been suggested for it. <laughs> but I can't change at the, this old age. And yeah. I think the old phrase is the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Yeah. So that's it. All right. I'm going to throw this open. We have about five minutes for questions. Anybody? I don't know if you have microphones to give you. I don't see anyone with a microphone, so just shout a lot. Yeah, get up and ask question. Yeah. I said shout a lot. Yeah, like give you, we'll give you a microphone. Huh? Now don't shout. Now don't shout. Now, yeah. now, now uh, softly and normally. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the Times of India group and uh, the Mujan Yote for uh, organizing this magnificent event. I can uh, hear this conversation all day long, but my two questions are: as a Calcutian, the influence and the love for the Indian Chinese cuisine. So you can share a little bit of that. And as a chef, uh, I want to ask uh, one question is that why did Escoffier and Ritz... I'll call you in five minutes. Sorry, 
Uh, you want to ask him? No, no, I have had the, I had the okay. question. No, his first question was about Indian Chinese food. Indian Chinese food. And the food, second one is? Uh, why did Escoffier and Ritz leave the Great Sava Hotel in London? A, I'm not sure we know. B, I don't think anyone cares. So we'll no, answer no, the first no, question. No, I think huh? the second part is even more important. <laughs> even if we knew, I think nobody cares. Yeah. And even if I knew, I wouldn't care. I, so can't, I okay. can't tell you if you are really interested. <laughs> yes. They left because there was a scandal with suppliers and it turned out that Escoffier was taking kickbacks from suppliers. They were thrown out. They didn't leave voluntarily. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, he, He'll answer the Chinese no, food question. The, the Indian Chinese food part, yeah. I think, is a very, very complex thing. Somebody should do a good sociological <laughs> study of that. In 1962, there was a much uh, talked about Sino-Indian war. Yeah. And when the hotel called Laguna had its uh, marquee uh, torn down, and nobody could dare to have a Chinese restaurant for a few years after that. Right. The irony is when the Chinese had the revival of Chinese cooking in India, the, the poor Tengra Chinese um, from Kolkata were still under observation. They were trying to go get away from there. The only Cantonese good food were there. But the other Chinese restaurants, ironically, were being run by Tibetan refugees, yeah. persecuted by Chinese, or Nepalese not good. Magars and Tamangs and Limbus and rice look alike. Uh, to make it look like Chinese. So you had red velvet all over, a fat laughing Buddha, and a Tibetan who was serving you, and you thought it was there. So yeah. in, in early 60s, you went to Delhi in a place called Majnuka Tila, the tip dabs, and you had Chang, and you had Tupka, and it was the poor man's, uh, the young students and the young lecturers' staple. You got hooked to some of those days. Now you come, and my angst about tandoor, you now have a tandoori momo. So, and yep. Momo is, is Momo part Chinese, it is Sui Mei, it is Dim Sum, or do you think that which brought what, Arnico took it to China, or in the age of fifth patriarch, it came from China to uh, Tibet, is another story. So, again, the point is that I do think that there were Nepalese who had given, or, or take, take for instance Sikkim, Sikkim was part of Nepal. Uh, till the British took it over, or Kalimpong, etc. So there, were, there was a Nepalese irredenta in India, and Ladakh was called the smaller Tibet. So in, it was not as if Indians did not know of foods akin to Chinese. So And the Great Silk Route ran from China to Turkey, and tributaries came to India. So I think it needs a lot more research to say that how, as Virbhai said earlier, that why the Gujaratis go for a certain kind of a Chinese food, why the Tamilians go both basically vegetarian, yeah. and those who are non-vegetarians Indians are pretty happy with Indian non-vegetarian and they don't need, uh, because they still suspect what the Chinese eat. Unless you go to Chhattisgarh and eat a chapar chutney, which is made out of yellow ants, then you eat everything like the Chinese. True. And uh, one more question, the French influence in the Awadhi cuisine, if I can discuss some of that. We'll have a drink with you and we'll discuss No, it, but, but to, answer your, to answer your question shortly and honestly, I think, because I think I would entirely second his thing. You buy us a drink and we'll talk at length. Yeah. Uh, but the French man, the adventurer was Claude Barton uh, in Lucknow, who much before the British came had introduced pastry making and that is where is the origin of the Pardeki biryani and things of that kind. Thank you, thank you. That's thank Claude Martin of La Martinière, yeah, who's, who La Martinière is named after. Right. Anybody else with a question? Yeah, sir, we'll give you the microphone. Yeah, uh, do you see a resurgence of ethnic food in the cities all across? Because in Calcutta, we see that we get in at least a dozen restaurants outside our home, which almost replicates home cooking, typically Bengali cooking. And there's a huge interest in that. So Would you go? I mean, I'm always intrigued because a lot of Bengalis I know yeah. go to these places. Yeah. And they say the food is not bad, but my mother can make it at home for no money at all. Why should I waste money on but this? But he will not make it at home, so he has so to go to the restaurant. So uh, my, my theory, he, I'm sure Prashpaji has his own view, yeah. is that as people stopped getting these dishes at home, because mothers stopped cooking, wives stopped cooking, servants were hard to come by, there were no cooks, people went out to restaurants to get them. That's why you tell me. I have a problem with this ethnic food at home and mother's food and so on. Yeah. Because uh. mother comes from a, some other family when she is wed to the father. All right. Yeah. So one stream of cooking comes to the kitchen, yeah. which was not originally there. Okay. Then the daughter, if there is one, gets married to another house. She uh. carries some of that food yes. to her. Yeah. And when you say ethnic Bengali food next to my doorstep, yeah. are you talking of Bangal or Goti? 
are you talking of a Bhadralok, the Jura Sako and the Tagore's uh, Pirali <laughs> Brahman family? Yeah. Or are you talking of somebody lower down the scale? Uh -huh. Somebody who has probably survived the 1943 no. Nabane days? No, yes. I'm serious about this. Uh -huh. Because I think, is the Silat food the same as Mehman Singh food? Is it the same as Dhaka food? Is it the same as Murshidabadi uh, city cuisine? So I think the ethnicity, there's one other trend. We are becoming aware of sub-ethnicities and zones of yeah. taste, which are, I mean, if you take of Concord Coast, it, do you think that the Saraswat cuisine in Goa is the same as Mangalorean cuisine? Or do you think it's the same as Hubli Dharwad cuisine? So I think that is some awareness which is dawning on us. Thank you. Okay, you got a longer answer than you bargained <laughs> Thanks for. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, the lady, the hi. Hello, hi. Hi. Uh, what is your view on molecular cu cooking? Uh, if any chef had enough brains, he would be in Bahaba Atomic Research Center, not in the kitchen doing molecular things. I think that takes care of that one. Anybody else? Ma'am, they're giving you a mic. Wait a second. Yeah, go on. Uh, uh, you were talking about the future of uh, popular food or cuisine and everything. As a consumer only, uh, there is, I find a dearth of food which is both healthy, tasty, and we know, for instance, where people have constraints, the calorific value or let's say the protein, uh, in it, you know, if you have some issues. Uh, there is a dearth of healthy food which tastes very good. Okay, good point. And then no, no, I take the a person who can do this, yeah. I mean, people will beat a part to their door. Uh, this is really like asking for a magic wand. I'll share a story with you. My granddaughter was eating all kinds of junk food, not healthy at all. So I looked at her and said, why do you eat all this junk food? She is about 10 years old. She looked at me hard and said, what is junk for me is good food for me. I have great energy requirements. I need my sugar fix. I need my fats. I need my carbs. You better watch about what is good for you. So m my problem is that there is no one solution like Lady Goldilocks' story, one healthy food for everybody. And ma'am, you complicated your question for me to answer honestly at all. You brought in the question of taste there. Now, w what is tasty for you might be like the Punjabi abominable <coughs> things which I mentioned, uh, terrible for me. So it, you can't have one taste for everybody and you can't have one health solution unless you are a professional nutritionist trying to popularize a gluten-free diet or millets at a particular moment. Uh, I don't think it's possible. All right. I think we can take one more probably. Yeah. At the back there, we can get you the microphone. To continue with what she had asked, uh, when we go to restaurants, even like Indian accent, we find this uh, food very sweet. But when we cook Indian food, the authentic food at home, it's not that sweet. So why is or why are all the restaurants adding sugar to the food? I just can't understand. And y'all as influencers, I don't know. I mean, if y'all can help there, you know, we just don't enjoy the food because it's so sweet all the time. Uh, I think poor Manish Malhotra would have a shock if you told him that all his food tasted yeah, sweet. I mean, I, I've had a shock. Would you go ahead? <laughs> because I think you eat his food and it gives you all the shadras. Yeah. I think he presents that brilliantly. Another chef, you see why I did not mention Manish is that Manish is almost an institution now. Yeah. And he is so much, and he's also no longer an Indian, he's a non-resident Indian for all practical purposes. He spends most of his time in London and New York and so on. But the point is that we tend to forget that, take Kolkata, I mean, isn't there an element of sweet in everything here also? Do you think that Gujarati food is without sweet? Mitu is only namak? And do you think that Parsi food, Jardalu Boti, is not sweet? We tend to find in a restaurant something which is sweet, and we started with butter chicken. I mean, it has a pinch of sugar and kasuri methi to give it its distinct and taste. Honey. Honey. And, and honey. Honey sometimes. So we have a lot of food which is sweet, but ideally, as you say, we would have other flavors on the plate. In traditional thali, you would have an achar or a chutney, which will compensate. But I'm not so sure if Indians are ever too sweet in their food. Okay. I think that's about all we have time for. We've got to get this festival back on schedule. Thank you, Pushpeshi. Thank you, Pushpe. you, Thank you that sir. Was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.